Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listener. This is Brett, and welcome back to the Online Great Books Podcast. Today, Scott and Carl begin their two-part discussion on The Great Conversation, an essay written in 1952 by Robert Maynard Hutchins. And this essay was originally written for the first edition of The Great Books of the Western World, which Encyclopedia Britannica published. You can find the essay in its entirety in case you're impatient, because Scott and Carl really don't get much beyond the introduction. They don't get out of the Roman numeral pages in this first hour. And they mention a 14-page uh, abridged version, but on the Encyclopedia Britannica blog, you can find a 28-page downloadable PDF version. So maybe that's the longer version. In this blog post, Britannica assures you that this essay has been praised even by critics of the Great Books program. We'll see what Scott and Carl think. Make sure you come back next week. I really like the beginning of part two of this discussion, where Scott and Carl talk a little bit about the specific qualities of physical books most important to them. And there's a little bit of a preview of that right at the end of this hour as well. They're just starting to get into it. So thank you for your time and attention. And here we go. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And you should go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast. That's it. And get on the mailing list there. We had uh, enrollment close Monday at midnight, Carl. Is it Monday at midnight yes. or Sunday at midnight? I don't know. However that works. And I did the orientation last night and uh, got there a little early on the Zoom classroom thing and chatting people up. Like, hey, you know, where'd you hear about us? And so many of them said the podcast, but they didn't use the discount code. Oh, you're taking money out of my, my baby's mouth. Right. That's how Carl gets, that's how Carl makes his nut every month, guys. <laughs> So you, you got to go use if when you sign up you use the discount code OGB podcast. Also, if you go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast and sign up, he gets he gets credit for that one too. So that's how we know this show works and we're not just talking into the void. So uh help a cracker out. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I'd appreciate that. I'm glad you're listening. We need to start another show. We've talked about it for almost a year. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Which show is this? Your Works and Days podcast. Yeah, homesteading. Two rookies. Scott's less of a rookie than I am. Attempting to <sighs> grow stuff on one's own property. Yeah, it's brutal. That'd be fun. That'll be fun. Works and Days is that poem by Hesiod, which tells you how to farm from 3,000 years ago. Yeah, when? When do you want to do it? I don't know. You're going to have to tell me. <laughs> you've got plenty of room in your schedule. You have, uh, you've have you got nothing going on over there. Right. No, you, you know, I don't know. You tell me. And uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do that, I think. We have some members at Online Great Books who are hardcore, successful, long-term homestead folks like Todd that would be good to talk, have on the show and talk. Uh, we'll share all the things that we are screwing up up and uh eric who does it all on an acre yeah there's some interesting people and it's gonna matter it's gonna matter i think so yeah it wouldn't be a terrible thing if it mattered i, I almost wanted to say i hope it didn't you know i hope i hope everything remains prosperous and easy as it has you know where you can go to the store and everything you want is there in season or out of season and it doesn't cost very much and you know the number one health problem of the poor is obesity mm -hmm. that i it's crazy. That might not stay that way, given some geopolitical events. Yeah. So maybe you ought to plant some potatoes and turnips and other high-calorie crops that you can do. I did potatoes a year ago, and it was or two years ago. It was terrible. Apparently, when the soil gets hot, well, it wasn't terrible. I did get potatoes. 
but I was doing them in containers in my yard back here because I, I, I live currently in a stupid suburb where you have to have a lawn and I can't just dig it all up. And even if I did, they tore up the topsoil anyway. Right. So it's just, you know, an inch and a half of sod. But potatoes, apparently, Eric told me about this. If you do container potatoes, the problem is that when the soil gets hot, the potatoes quit growing. Baked potatoes. And so you get small potatoes, which I did. And they were wonderful, but they were small because I had these black fabric bags that I was using as containers. And, uh, yeah, that was no good. So I'm going to do better next time. That's all you can do, Carl, is better. That's all we can do. I tossed out the the idea of maybe doing some longer form shows, you know, I don't know, three or four shows ago where we would, maybe we would read some longer books and not put out a show every week. And we had some people email about it. Derek, listen to what Derek says. He says, good day. I'm a regular listener to your OGB podcast and an OGB member on a bit of a hiatus due to the amount of reading I must do for the degree I am pursuing. For what it's worth, I should tell you. Oh, that just quit. I know. <laughs> He says, uh, for what it's worth, I should tell you that I got more out of OGB sessions than I do school and currently get a far better philosophy education from the podcast than any course I have yet taken and can't wait to get back to the community. Oh. It's very kind. Thank you. He says, uh, from the perspective of a fan, the more shows that we can get, the better. As it stands, he currently listens to each of the shows as soon as they're available and may listen to them many times. That said, if you want to give a new format a try, I support the experiment. You just may need to provide a few recommendations of the other worthy podcasts for those of us with a weekly OGB habit. There are no other worthy podcasts. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're not. Like the one that's sponsored by National v Review is f terrible. The Hillsdale College one, terrible. Wait, wait, hold on. There are other worthy podcasts, but not not for what we do. Yeah, if you want to go listen to some wacky stuff, you can go listen to the Hermetics podcast. That's very interesting. You know, I'm not interested in um, in just normal stuff. I mean, you can get that anywhere. You know, the Hermetics podcast is pretty pretty darn weird and, and interesting. The, the host, Meta Nomad, is a super mm -hmm. smart guy. And uh, has th just the best questions for his guests. That's a good one. Brett over at the Art of Manliness. We always love Brett. Brett's been a big help to us. You can always, go, of course, go listen to to that one while it lasts. Uh, here's an interesting one, Carl. Here's a very interesting one. He says, I suggest, this is Andrew. He says, uh, I would suggest creating a Patreon or something similar where people can join and pay a certain amount each month in order to gain access to certain content. So you could have a content like Foot's Civil War series or whatever else that might be more niche or long form that you wanted to do. And then he says, in addition to the regular podcast, listen, that's the yeah. problem. Come on, man. <laughs> but uh, that could be interesting to maybe, maybe convert this to something like that where they – you know, got to attend our recordings or something like that. Or I don't know. I don't know. So like OnlyFans. <laughs> That's right. The, the, the ugliest OnlyFans ever. Something like that <laughs> could be interesting. Well, years ago when I was thinking about getting into this great books thing, the way you would do it was you would go be a tutor at one of the colleges mm -hmm. uh, that do it. And I was told by one of the tutors at St. John's in Albuquerque, the one in New Mexico. Yeah, it's Albuquerque. No, it's the Santa Fe. Santa Fe. You become a sleep-deprived creature and you drink lots and lots of coffee. Uh, so, you know, adding shows, I'd love to add shows, but I, I finished this great conversation thing last night at 11 o'clock and then I pulled out Horace's Odes because I need to get that up to speed for a seminar tonight and yep you know with all the other stuff going on so i feel like an athlete of reading you are carl look at you you have the kind of body that only a reading athlete could have <laughs> no, no, I don't i'm not sure if that's an insult to her <laughs> well there's some there's some midwit right now it's like you just said you're going to start another show uh well, i know but it, it, but the Homestead one, 
that's just going to be us griping about the week. Like, what's the prep? There's going to, there's not going to be any prep to that show. Like, this is what we did this week. This is what we killed. <laughs> Here, these are the <laughs> plants that died, or you know, whatever. Oh God, Brett, blessed Brett. You know, I had a I had a guy. Most people really like Brett's commentary ahead of the show, and I know I do. We never talk about. Well, I love it. it. Yeah, it's the only reason I ever listen to our podcast is I, I listen to Brett's comments and then I shut it off because I don't want to hear me. Yeah, you need to, you need to listen. You need to listen. I barely want to hear you. It's 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 so good. You need to listen. But we never talk about what he's going to say, and it's always he's always on point. He, so he's already said what we're going to be listening to or talking about today. It's this essay called The Great Conversation that's out of the front of your Encyclopedia Britannica Great Books of the Western World set. Uh, it's by Robert M. Hutchins. I think he was the pres. I think he was the president of the University of Chicago in the forties and fifties, and maybe even the sixties. This is a mess. Some people may not know Carl Hutchins was the president at the University of Chicago, and he found out about this Adler guy, and he hired him. Uh, I think Adler may have had a part time job or an adjunct job or something like that at Columbia. I think's how it went, and he hired him to come to the University of Chicago and they gave him a great deal of support. Adler was good on television and radio and um, became an advocate for the entire United States, Man, every man, woman, and child reading the great books of the Western world. University of Chicago was fortunate fortunate enough to have the University of Chicago Press where they had their own, they owned the right or at least had staffers there who had the rights to some very, very good translations of a lot of the Greeks, Greek works. Richmond Lattimore and David Green were there, and they had all the, the mm-hmm. what are still probably the best translations of the Greek plays and some other things. I think they had Fitzgerald, the right to the uh, Fitzgerald Iliad, for example, I think. So they were in a, in a perfectly good position to bring these books to a wider audience. And then television appeared, and Adler actually did a television show about reading these great books. He wrote a book called How to Read a Book. And all of this, I mean, Adler was an industrious and uh, tireless advocate for reading the great books. But Hutchins put put wheels under his machine or gave gave him resources that he might not otherwise have had. Uh, After working on this for quite a while, they cut a deal, the University of Chicago, somehow. I don't know all the legal particulars of this because they cut a deal with the Encyclopedia Britannica people to publish a 52-volume set of the great books of the Western world. Adler insisted on having an, an index to all of the topics for all 52 that, that spanned all 52 of these uh, volumes. He called that index the Syntopicon. It covers, I think, 103, what he calls the great ideas, and shows every pertinent passage from all of the authors across all 52 volumes. They busted their budget by about 3x, from what I understand, and it went over long to come up with this, and it was mostly coming up with the Syntopicon. Encyclopedia Britannica put that set out in 1952, and you'll still see them every now and then. Maybe your grandparents had one. I've got it. I've got I have three of them. Encyclopedia Britannica was the most expensive of the encyclopedias. I had a world book encyclopedia that I stole one piece at a time, like Johnny Cash. (laughs) I couldn't afford it. Like Johnny Cash stole the car. Right. Yep. I carried it off from the library one piece at a time uh, when I was in seventh grade. Uh, Statute of limitations is up on that. No, hold on. If you'd waited, you know, if you'd waited 15 years, the library would have given it to you. <laughs> right, right. Because libraries don't have books anymore. I know, I know. You know, they, they remove the books. Half the books that, I, that I've that i got in my collection, I have liberated from libraries. Yeah, the library sales and stuff. Oh, God, I have, La- I have Thomas Aquinas in Latin, like with no English. Just an old binding, four-volume set. They didn't want it anymore because who is going to read it? Carl. Except me. Athlete of books, Carl Shoot. I have a patristic lexicon of the Greek language. Where are you going to find that? Well, I know where you found it, but yeah. 
Hard to come by. Well, a, well, I'll tell you where you'll find it. You'll find it on abebooks.com or eBay. And then when it comes, you'll buy it. And when it comes in, you'll open it, and it'll have a stamp in it. Chicago Public Library, Amherst University Library, you know, where they retired the book. Almost every interesting mm-hmm. book I've bought in the last 10 years was Ex Libris. Encyclopedia Britannica sent people door to door to sell sets of encyclopedias and the great books of the Western world. You could buy it in a couple of different bindings. If you were really flush, you could even get the fitted bookcase that it fit in perfectly, and they would deliver it to your house. It is my suspicion that most of the Encyclopedia Britannica great books of the Western world sets that you see were actually thrown in to sweeten the regular deal for the the big encyclopedia. That big encyclopedia mm-hmm. in 1952 was like nine hundred dollars, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, it was like new car money. When I was a kid in the late seventies, Encyclopedia Britannica was like four grand, and people would make payments on them. So a lot of those sets were thrown in but wait there's more the guy would say and he would give you a set of those and so uh, a lot of them were never read most of them were never read i have a uh, third edition that is all in the cellophane yeah i've seen it but this essay here the great conversation is out of the front of that book these men were true believers hutchins and adler and the rest of the really the rest of the advisory committee, which included Stringfellow Barr and Erskine and, and so many of the names that you know, they're they're true believers. And being true believers, there are a lot of things they can believe and a whole lot more things that they can't believe. I am a recovering true believer. And uh I have read this and led seminar discussions of this essay many, many times over the last five, six, seven years. And my reading of this has changed, and my opinion of this this essay has changed a lot. And uh, I'm here to shit on it. Let's go. <laughs> it's not entirely terrible. No, it, it's, it's not. salesmanship. Uh, there are there are many good things that he says about books. I still think he's right. That well, no, I don't think he's right. I think you ought to read the great books, dear listener. Mm-hmm. I don't think necessarily that everybody ought to read the great books. More people ought to read them than do. But, I mean, a lot of people can't read. A lot of people can't read. My home group, I think I've told this story on the show before, but I'll tell it again. My home book group is comprised of, it's mostly guys. No, it's all men at this point. We'd had some ladies that joined it, and they had had dropped away. It's all men. They are from uh, 25 to 71 years old. There are several of them that have master's degrees. They are engineers, professional people, high IQ people, frankly. And we found that we didn't really know how to read. We were taught to read to skim and scan. We were taught to read for the quiz on Friday. We were taught to read, or or we were habituated to read a technical manual. Like, you know, I'm going to flip through here until I find the few pages I need to know how to select this particular I-beam for this application, mm-hmm. but not read the whole thing. We were skimmers and scanners. We had a very utilitarian, you know, what, way of reading things. And it doesn't work for a close reading of this of this good material. So these are literate people, you know, and we had to back up and go get Adler's book, How to Read a Book, and remediate our reading so that we could go on and do a good job with this. And So we're supposedly literate. There are people that are functionally illiterate. I mean, lots of them, and it's growing emoticons and text messages and 10 things they don't want you to know about, you know. Yeah, the saddest four letters in the English language are TLDR. Right. If you're smarter, you just say QED. Well, let me start with uh, the first and second paragraphs Mm. on page XII. So you you people at home can get your own. Because I know you have those books, right? If you listen to us, you've picked up a copy of these books. They're floating around there. They are. The editors are convinced that the West needs to recapture and re-emphasize and bring to bear upon its present problems the wisdom that lies in the works of its greatest thinkers and in the discussion that they have carried on. Right there is the the root of the, the failures of this essay. To bring to bear upon its present problems. 
He says a little further, we are concerned as anybody else at the headlong plunge into the abyss that Western civilization seems to be taking. Uh, and at the end of that paragraph, we want the voices of the great conversation to be heard again because we think they may help us to learn to live better now. In other words, you should read these books because they'll improve your life or they'll improve your political climate, or they'll make your nation better. And that's not why I read them. I think that is confusing a side effect for the main effect. The main reason you read them is because this is the divine work that Aristotle talks about in the Nicomachean Ethics. This is what humans are supposed to do. We're supposed to think. You do it because it's a good activity. Even if it had no great effect in the world, you should do it. I agree with that. Hutchins doesn't. Mm -mm. He he doesn't. He's doing this for another purpose, entirely different. He has a different metaphysical judgment of the books. Like He thinks they're different than you and I think they are. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I can't predict what you're going to be like after you read these things, I can't predict the way that your personal politics will drift. He thinks he can. Yeah. He thinks it's going to make you better. It's going to make you more like Robert Hutchins. And it will lead to a better world. This is the crux of my whole problem with this essay. And maybe actually the Great Books Movement. I think that they need to be read for the reasons that you described because there is something divine and special about them and they are edifying to the individual. And there's something divine and special about you. Yes. And you too, Carl. You too, man. Well, I, I wasn't, my, you wasn't specific to you. It was a general one. Oh, that kind of (laughs) hurts. I mean, you're part of the set of the things that have a divine nature, but it wasn't just you. Listen, your set theory doesn't make me feel better. I thought you were, Loving on me. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, Charity, you're part of the set of the things that I think are special. It's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so, so if Hutchin says, if Hutchin believes that there are solutions to our problems within these books, how would we know what those solutions were and how are they presented? And then how do we know that they're true? Now, if you go look at the great books of the Western world, you'll see that there is Adam Smith and Marx in there. There is Aristotle and there are, is Hume. Of those two pairs I mention, they both can't be right. Well, how does Hutchins think that we're going to read Smith and then we're going to read Marx and then we're going to know the truth about how to deal with economic problems. Because those, those two guys are m- mostly opposed to each other. I think he's basically Hegelian. I think that he thinks that you read this one and you read that one, and then there's a synthesis that comes from it, and then you, then you heal the world. Mm-hmm. I don't think the books take you necessarily in the direction he thinks they do. Mm-mm. Alcibiades hung out with Socrates. Did his liberal education lead him to be a mid-century progressive like Hutchins would like? Right. You know, that's so interesting. Alexander the Great studied with Aristotle. So they don't necessarily lead where you think they lead. Hutchins is pre-greatest generation. He's an older man than the quote-unquote greatest generation. I don't know what his birth date was, but um, he was far past draft age in World War II would be my guess. And he led many, 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 many people through the great books, even though so many of those encyclopedia were pretend. He was born 1899. Uh, even though so many of those uh, encyclopedia Britannica sets went unread, he, between activities at the basic program at the University of Chicago and the people that did actually read those, um, he saw a lot of people transformed by reading the books, and more than you and I have seen, and we've seen a lot of them transformed by these books. Mm -hmm. If he was, in fact, seeing a liberal, progressive, uh, mid-century person that he thought is being created by those books, it's way more social than as a result of the books, because that is not what we're seeing coming out of these books right now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
Yeah. That is not what we're seeing. <laughs> right. You might think unthinkable things after you read them. They're dangerous. That's another reason to read them. They're dangerous. They're not necessarily going to make you a tame animal. No. They'll open up vistas of, of thought that you currently can't think. Do you know what I mean by that? So that, like, I can't think very well about colors. I can see them, but I have no idea what the difference between sea foam and green is. I do know that actual sea foam isn't anything like the color sea foam. I've heard that there are these colors. I can't distinguish them. I can't think intelligently about them. I can't talk about them. There's a reason for that. Because there's nothing intelligent to say about color? Qua color, yeah. <laughs> so let's say if I could read a book that, that led me... I'm trying to make a bad analogy here, I guess. But if I could read a book that explained to me the, the variations of color in a way that I could see it more easily and distinguish the 43 kinds of pink... Well, then I could do things with color that I can't do now. So there are things you cannot think. There are things that Hutchins can't think. In this book, he he presumes the goodness of democracy. That's an unquestioned premise for him. Yep. Well, you read these books and you might question his premise. Page two, book one, Aristotle's politics. He posits the natural slave. You know, and I'm thinking, did did Hutchins read that? Did he take it seriously enough? He he clearly didn't. Yeah. Maybe we should flesh his position out here a little more. Yeah. He, he says that these books are not offered in an antiquarian spirit. He's not a museum keeper. He's not a he's not an archivist. He thinks that these have relevance today, right now. TLDR. You get to the end of the you get to the end of this essay, which is uh, about it's my, uh, here on my PDF. It's twenty eight pages. He talks about the dangers of nuclear war, nuclear and atomic warfare, and th he essentially calls for a one world government. And he believes that that government should be some sort of a representative government, and that the citizens of this government can save the world from atomic and nuclear warfare if they all had a proper liberal arts education and had read these books. Am I blowing him out of proportion here? Am I saying, am I putting words in his mouth, Carl? No, no, that was my reading as well. And okay. So the one world government stuff. Yeah. You could get that from this set of books. Yeah, sure. You could. Yeah. Plato tells us you could get something else. Right. The idea that reading them and talking about them with a group of intelligent people is going to lead you to where he goes and make one world government easy and possible. I don't think so. You still ought to read the books, but I wondered how much of this essay, I mean, there's some, I have a bunch of outline stuff that's worth you know, giving to the listener, but let's do it where he says some good and useful things. But I wondered about this essay is, is this in earnest or is it? salesmanship i think it's in earnest carl i think he's a true believer page x i i i we believe that the reduction of the citizen to an object of propaganda private and public is one of the greatest dangers to democracy a prevalent notion is that the great mass of the people cannot understand and cannot form an independent judgment on any matter they cannot be educated in the sense of developing their individual powers but they can be bamboozled all right so okay I think he's right in the first part. The reduction of a citizen to an object of democracy is a great danger. It doesn't matter if it's a democracy or not. Right. If I live in a republic or a monarchy or whatever, I still want you to read these books. Yeah. I'm going to read that next sentence here. The reiteration of slogans, the distortion of the news, the great storm of propaganda that beats upon the citizen 24 hours a day all his life long mean either that democracy must fall a prey to the loudest and most persistent propagandists or that the people must save themselves by strengthening their minds so that they can appraise the issues for themselves. Great books alone will not do the trick for the people must have the information on which to base a judgment as well as the ability to make one. 
in order to understand inflation, for example, and to have an intelligent opinion as to what can be done about it, the economic facts in a given country at a given time have to be available. Isn't this interesting? I mean, like, when did when did he write this? When in the 50s was there inflationary policy? I don't know. It was published in 52, so maybe he wrote it in 50, 51. I don't know. I think that the one lesson of the great books that almost every single person I have ever spoken to who's read them in earnest says that they got from them is that things have not changed. You know, we've helped hundreds and hundreds or maybe thousands of people work through the classical period at this point. Almost to a person, they say that the main lesson is, boy, things haven't changed. How can Hutchins think that the that, that it's going to change i don't understand what he read what is he doing <laughs> he's a college administrator he doesn't read adler knew him adler lived a long time yeah and, almost 100 years yeah and so there's there's early middle late and really really late adler um and i think by the end uh late adler was m- probably more more like me or me more like him than Hutchins here. So Hutchins uh, also, gosh, he thinks for you to be a proper citizen in a democracy, you need to have this education that only these books can get you. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have anything to say about, well, if they don't read them, do we let them vote? I mean, that's the corollary, right? Like, if you need to be a good citizen, you need to read these books. Well, if somebody can't pass, you know, give a book report on them, they don't get to vote then, right, Robert? He reminds me of Protagoras. Okay, so Protagoras has this argument with Socrates, young Socrates, about virtue and whether there are teachers of virtue. And Protagoras claims that there are teachers of virtue all around you, that that the gods have so input have so put into humans a sense of justice that we are capable of deliberating about these uh, issues. Socrates, there are teachers of virtue all around you and you're too delicate to see them. Okay, so Protagoras, if he was talking in Athenian democracy, in the salons of Athenian democracy, there's this great image that Plato has where he he's walking through the crowd. He's the great man. He's like a ship going through the waves, and mm. the waves close in behind him, and it's, it's hilarious. But what do you have to say to people who have chosen uh, democracy? You have to say that everyone has the capacity to vote in the assembly. In other words, they have to understand justice. Right. If democracy is going to be workable, the people must be able to be educated in matters of justice. Well, if they are not able to be educated in matters of justice, then democracy is not workable. Mm -hmm. If P, then Q. If not Q, then not P. So Hutchins is out on a limb here, and he he actually says it somewhere in here. I quoted it in our Slack. Uh, He says pretty clearly what I say. If, If we can't do this, then democracy is doomed. Yes. So as a guy who runs a great books program me and hutchins you know we got something something in common i mean he was doing that Mm -hmm. we have to go on our podcast and write our essays and say that everybody can do this and that they should but not everybody can do this they can't you know aristotle talks about people have these different proclivities some people do not have the gifts uh, and those gifts might include intellect, and in, or those gifts might have the skills to just do it, you know, to sit down and have the discipline to actually do it. Um, some people don't want to do it. Some people don't care. Some people are too sick to do it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, not everybody can do it. Darn it! So if it's, and I think they, sh- I think everyone should try. I also think that most of these books. The Iliad, for example, the Odyssey, has something for everyone. Yeah, You can go as deep as you want on the Iliad. And you can go as deep as you want on Aristotle, but you can't go as shallow as you want. Yeah, There are some of these That's books fair. that are that are just not accessible to some people. If you're not willing to really do the thing, to spend the time with Aristotle, the book remains closed, you know. 
Mm-hmm. He has nothing to say about that. And maybe he can't. Maybe it is some salesmanship, you know? But maybe he can't say it. I'll say it. Yeah, we're not selling the books. They're not selling the books. Nope. We're selling memberships. <laughs> Actually, you know what? There aren't very many people. I mean, we're not a big organization. I mean, I know for a fact yeah. that I could put a Facebook ad in front of 3 million people and nobody will click on it. Nobody wants to even do this. They, they don't want to do it. You know, the, these stupid people on like Shark Tank, I haven't watched Shark Tank in forever, but there are these stupid business people. They're like, okay, now listen, listen, there's 7 billion people on the face of the earth. And if we can just get one tenth of 1%. There isn't one-tenth of one percent of seven billion that wants to do this. There's not. Now, there should be more. There should be a lot more. Young men out there, you're probably not listening to me right now anyway, but who are who are devoting hours and hours in maxing out, I don't even know what the current games are, Skyrim or, that's years ago, whatever the current immersive games are that you are you know, sometimes, Scott, mm. in the past, I would go on the online servers to play some of these games and immediately get smoked. Oh, of course. Because some kid out there has maxed out the armor and the weapons and figured everything out about this game to destroy me in half a second and then laugh at me for being a noob. Yeah. Uh, heck, <laughs> my youngest boy can do that. We Sometimes we do Halo Deathmatch. Yeah. And he's a killer. <laughs> Aristotle will do that to you, too. It's like, noob. <laughs> and then teabags you. <laughs> you people out there that are, are spending so much intellectual effort on that sort of thing, you could read these books. You could. Right now, you probably don't want to, but you could. And I think it'd be a better use of your time. The literature stuff, I think the plays and the Iliad, I think a whole bunch of people could get a lot out of those. Oh, yeah. Aristotle is going to be hard for a bunch. Yeah. M- much of Plato is accessible to everyone. So before I get back here to page 15 XV, how many people do you think can read these in earnest and do well with them, Carl? A percentage. Put you on the spot here. You know, I can. Yeah, I said one tenth of one percent won't even do it, but I, I think that I think that seventy or eighty percent of people would benefit greatly from a sort of attempt of it of these books. Maybe more, maybe ninety percent if it's done at the right time. So, and and Hutchins does say something. He says something useful. I'm conceding that to him. Uh, I forget where it is on. The way that we do these books, when I was in high school, uh, and I was a nerd, so I was much more likely to get stuff out of the books in high school than most people, I think. But, you know, you're, you're made to read A Tale of Two Cities, Dickens, which Dickens is very great, but for a 15-year-old to be slogging through 800 pages of Dickens is is real hard. It's not... He, he he doesn't care. It was the best of the times. It was the worst of the times. Who cares? Right. You know, you read that when you're 30 or 40 and you have big life decisions, maybe this thing hits you between the eyes. Yeah. Er, er, what Aristotle says, what? You don't teach philosophy till what, 28? I don't know. I think Plato says somewhere, uh, you finally get to study philosophy when you reach 50. Yeah. That may be. Thomas Aquinas died at 49. <laughs> well, he didn't say teach it. He just said st- yeah, so we ruin a lot of these books by, I mean, they got to read something, but we ruin them by forcing them on people when they're too young. And then, and then, and Hutchins makes this point too, we make, uh, and I think he's right, he says that we presume that no education happens after you get out of high school yeah. or college. So you got to jam it all in because we presume that nobody's going to crack a book after they're 22 years old. That's a pretty good presumption. And so if you have a culture of reading or of, of a culture of culture, there are good things out there that you should look at. Well, you don't, you're not so worried that the kid hasn't read Moby Dick. Yeah. He'll read it when it's, when it's time. And that book is dynamite. Oh, it's killer. It's one of my favorites, Carl. You lost me with Dickens. I'm back with uh, Moby Dick. 
Dickens on the short stories is great. I don't have a problem with him, but Moby Dick is the cat's ass. He got paid by the word, and, and he got paid. Uh, Hudgens says, A second element of novelty in the presentation of these books at this time is found in the proposition that democracy requires liberal education for all. We believe this prop proposition is true. We concede that it has not been scientifically proved. I think that a lot of this essay, particularly this paragraph here, is a reaction to Dewey. The progressives, the American progressives, had had a great influence on education. By the late 40s, they were, the effects of that influence were being felt heavily. And I think that this is a reaction largely to Dewey and his like. So it might not be the fullness of what, you know, Hutchins thinks about this stuff and more of a reaction to Dewey. You know, he concedes that it hasn't been scientifically proved. Like Dewey thinks that through some scientific methods and experimentation that we can improve on education of young people. He also thinks that education, proper education will tr change based on the, the technology of the day and the social mores and movements of the day. I don't agree with that, and I don't think Hutchins does either. We believe that there is such a thing as a proper education that exists, you know, for all times. Yeah, well, he says uh, somewhere, if there is a human nature, then there's a, a human education. Right. You know, there is a sheep nature, which means, therefore, there's a proper way to raise sheep. Carl, we went, we went and saw yes. Mr. Greg Judy this weekend, Charity and I. I heard. I saw the pictures. And Mrs. Judy has a pet dog. He's it's a he's supposed to be a guardian, sheep guardian dog, but he's a pet. He's useless for guarding. His name's Smokey. Biggest dog I've ever seen in my mm -hmm. life. Is like a polar bear. The dog, the, the dog's head wouldn't fit in a five gallon bucket. The, the biggest dog I have ever seen. Unbelievable. Uh huh. Great Pyrenees, I guess. Giant, giant dog. Super sweet. Comes up and leans on me. About broke my leg. I tore my ACL. I fell over. <laughs> huge, huge dog. Oh my goodness. But that dog has a nature. Yeah. So if you want to train that dog, well, by the way, we need to talk about the difference between training and education here. But if you want to train that dog, because you can't educate a dog in sheep guardianship, but you can train him, there is a way to do that because he is a dog. And if humans are things, then there is a way to train mm -hmm. or educate them. Dewey's very interested in training. He's really not interested in education. He's more ed interested in imparting yeah. particular skills. And Hutchins wants to figure out how to give someone a general education, something they can synthesize on so that they can know when they see a new situation, they can say to themselves, is this just or not? Right. And so where, the, where this breaks down... One of the places. ...with the human is... So I can have you read all the great books. We can study them together. Now you have a basis upon which you're like a jazz musician. You have a, a, a sufficient technical facility with the instrument to be able to play whatever you want. There's the rub, whatever you want. So you can play nice stuff I like Chet Baker. You can play crap like Ornette Coleman. <laughs> yes. But both of them you know, have the same sort of training in the music on different instruments. But I could have said Miles Davis. Later Miles, is, don't bother with yeah. later Miles. I can't predict or determine what you're going to do. I can't predict what you're going to value. I remember a book by Vladimir Soloviev, who's a Russian philosopher. Can I talk about sure. Russians? I, for one, welcome our Russian overlords. <laughs> Uh, well, they probably don't like Soloviev because he was a crypto Catholic. Mm. Uh, probably was a Catholic at the end. But he wrote, he was in response to Aristotle. Aristotle says, live a life of moderation. And, and Soloviev was like, why do I care about moderation? 
if life is finite and limited, then he thinks that Aristotle's approach to ethics doesn't quite work because you don't need to be moderate. Just laying out to somebody, and he's, he's right, Soloviev is not a libertine, but he's making a point that uh, just because you present to me temperance as a virtue, and even if you explain to me how being intemperate leads to destruction, that doesn't mean I'm not going to choose destruction. Well, that's why you need Thomas to fix that for you. But but yeah, I hear him. Well, even with Thomas, even with Thomas, you don't have to choose the good. No. No, but when you put the beatific vision in there, it changes the math. It changes Aristotle's. It does change the math, but you can still say, no, no thanks. Of course. Okay. And that's the difference between training and education. Yeah. The dog can't really choose. It's either a good dog for its purpose or it's a bad dog for its purpose. It's not choosing yeah. to be bad. Dog lovers, I'm sorry, but they, they, it's, it's just not happening. No. Imagine if dogs could choose. They, there would be a day they would rise up in revolution. Yeah, I don't want Smokey to choose. No. <laughs> I pulled up in their driveway and I saw that dog. And... I just sat in the truck. I called him. I said, there's this giant dog out here. I'm just going to stay here till you get here. And he said, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> when I was out with, uh, I was out with m one of my daughters, um, looking at properties a while back. And we found this place. It had this beautiful pasture and nice fencing. It, it looked good. And we're out looking at it. And this huge dog just starts galloping up to us. And we didn't have time to get in the car or anything. And, and, uh, both a little scared and I think it was a great Pyrenees but he just came up and he rolled over yeah. presented his belly wouldn't let us leave would block us from the door yeah they're scared looked fearsome was not fearsome yeah. oh gosh yeah but... this is so difficult all right so, so difficult I'm gonna pull out good things that he says okay interesting things that he says if we ever get out of the, the Roman numeral pages, XVI, mm. he talks about leisure. He thinks that the mechanization has brought more leisure time, which it, it did. We confess that we have had principally in mind the deeds, the needs of the adult population who, in America at least, have as a result of the changes of the last 50 years the leisure to become educated men and women. They now have the chance to understand themselves through understanding their tradition. Our principal aim in putting these books together was to offer them the means of doing so. Okay, so you have more leisure time. You ought to have, Hutchins thinks, a good use of that leisure. Yeah, I agree. Well, why not read these books? I'm not sure that the leisure time is necessarily a good thing. I think it leads us to like TikTok dances and stuff. Yeah, how much leisure do you need? It'd be better if they be better if they they didn't have enough leisure right <laughs> leisure can be bad for a human leisure could be bad for animals uh you were telling me before the podcast about putting a bunch of animals in close confinement and they start doing all sorts of weird things yeah, santana he said that's the calhoun study from the 40s yeah they don't have to to hunt for their living they're living their food's provided but they're in confinement and they start doing crazy stuff So leisure, leisure is not an unmitigated good. No. Leisure is a problem to be solved. You know, uh, Star Trek is far superior to Star Wars. I used to be... What's Star Wars? Yeah, I don't know. It's that... I can't say anything good about it. it um, Star Trek depicts this this world of the future where everyone's economic needs needs are met. You push a button on, and a turkey dinner comes out of the wall and you don't, you know, what do they call that thing? The replicator? It's a 3D printer, right? I mean, I mean we're we're trying to get there. And and the whole Star Trek world is the the idea is that everybody's needs economic needs are met so they can pursue their interests. So Scotty loves machines and whatever and he's the he's the head of engineering. Spock does his thing. Bones does medicine. You know, whatever. Kirk likes boning weird alien ladies and seeing new places. So you know that's what they do. You know, Marx also had this vision of people. You know, 
uh, working a little bit in the morning and painting in the evening. And, and, and the truth of it is, that's not what happens. They eat Cheetos. And they're like, doctor, doctor, why are mm-hmm. my genitals orange? You know, they don't, it's, <laughs> it's not what happens. So what, number one, there's that. People don't work their leisure like we would have them or like Peeper would have them do, right? And then the thing that irritates me the most about this is that this is sort of the – well, Brett McKay has talked about this. You know, in the 70s, we had the leisure suit. You know, there, there was just this idea that people were just going to have to work 28, 30 hours a week. We we're going to go to a four-day work week. We we're going to go to a six-hour work day, whatever, and that – Everybody was going to pursue these hobbies. And I don't know when it happened, but that reversed at some point, probably in the mid 80s. People's work weeks started getting longer, their commutes started getting longer, and their leisure started disappearing. Think about leisure in terms of just two income households. If one person is at home, you've got a washing machine, a microwave oven, a gas cook range, a vacuum cleaner, uh, and a refrigerator, we don't have to can. Like that person, listen, whether you like it or not, and your stupid feminist acts to grind, that's not a terrible life as opposed to actually going to work, getting dressed, the commute, listening to the stupid speech from the HR, the blah, 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 blah. Like there was one person that was hooked up in terms of economic production. Well, now both people mm-hmm. have to be hooked up with e- economic production. And the floor still has to get vacuumed. The laundry still has to be done. Somebody still has to come up with some food. So, it, you know, in terms of economic production, it's at least doubled since 1952. The burden of it has at least doubled since 1952. So, you know, thanks, progressives. We're progressing towards, I don't know what, total work life. What? What do we progress? What do we want? What are we talking about? Total economic output? Can we monetize my sleep? If economic output is the measure of the worth of a person, then everybody needs to work all the time. We need to monetize my sleep somehow. Do you make interesting sounds? I don't know. You could sell them on the Patreon page. That time I spend sleeping, it's a waste. But anyway, you get the point. You know, like, how. What, what, what are people going to do with their leisure? And then the leisure activities are now designed to hack your biochemistry and to be addictive. Dopamine receptors, yeah. I'm just thinking. So I, I for business reasons, I returned to the Instagram. I'm sorry. There is a shoot strength account at Instagram. It's only going to talk about strength training and you know, to promote myself as a coach, you can find at barbell-logic.com. I'm not going to talk about acorns. You know, because I think that's what got me banned, acorn harvesting. They don't want you to know that you can eat acorns. They don't. They banned you over it. The craft company, or Nestle, one of these food conglomerates, said, nope, shut that guy down. Uh, but no, you post something, and I notice it myself. I, I'll, I'll post, here's a picture of me taking a deadlift and saying something, or, or deadlifting, and saying something interesting about deadlifting. All right, and then I post it. Well, what do you do two minutes later? Has anyone liked it? That little thumbs up, right. whoever at Facebook invented that. Speaking of McKay, he's had people on talking about this. It is designed to hack your system. And so you keep checking. Well, did anyone... It, that's stupid. You shouldn't care. You know, maybe you go back in a day or two and see how it did. But it's it's designed to be addictive. You'd definitely be better off reading these books. I had a thought on how to make them. Hutchins, I think, is this door-to-door salesmanship was it was all right, but the real way to get people to read them would be to forbid them. Mm. I was see. I was immediately trying to figure out how to get like naked girls in them or something. <laughs> Yeah, banning would be good. Aristotle could have a centerfold, but they don't want you to read the politics. No. Don't get caught reading this book. <laughs> 52 books they don't want you to read. So there's a, I want to go to page XVIII. Will we get out of the introduction? 
That's where I am too. In in two hours. Uh, I think this line here, I don't know if I had read this essay at the time. I probably did. And I think it got me in trouble. So I was an adjunct for a long time at a university out here and there had been promises and soft promises of a full-time position. You get a humanities PhD, your academic career these days is likely you're going to be stuck as an adjunct. Yeah. Because they don't need to hire you. Because you, stupid fool, will go teach their classes without tenure. And there's more of you than there is demand for you. So if you don't want to do it, somebody else will. All right. Well, anyway, so they would promise things like, yeah, Carl, well, uh, there'll be a position opening up. I remember I went to a faculty meeting and we were talking about curriculum issues. And I made the point that, you know, they wanted, they wanted to internationalize the curriculum. There was a core curriculum and they wanted to internationalize it and, you know, read books of the East and, and this sort of thing. And I'm sitting in that meeting and they're all proposing their books that they want, that they think are important. And they're proposing modern books. And I, I said, kind of quoted Hutchins here. He says, the reason for the omission of authors and works after 1900 is simply that the editors did not feel that they or anyone else could accurately judge the merits of contemporary writings. And I don't think it, it might have been Handmaid's, Handmaiden's Tale. You, know, you, you can't know if that book's any good. Yeah, I can know if it's bad. I might not know. You're too close to it. Well, I was being diplomatic right. and just saying maybe it's good, but we don't know. It's too close. You know, I like Camus. I'm not sure it's a great book. I like The Plague. I think it's a pretty good book. I don't know that it's great. Right. Ask me in 100 years. I mean, who? I don't know who reads it anymore. But, which is part of the reason for our code of conduct at OGB, where we try not to bring up contemporary issues, because the thing that you think is so important might not be. No, it's so boring. <sighs> yeah, this is we're in the section here where he's kind of where he's trying to defend their selections of the actual you know volumes of the great books of the Western world set. All of the. Um, the nitpicking about what should be on the list, I find it pretty tiresome. You know, nobody reads in, much of it anyway. You know, there's a there's a chunk that almost nobody would debate about. You know, Plato and Aristotle need to be on the list. The Iliad needs to be on the Homer. list. Right. Just go read those. Like, nobody reads the 54 volumes but me. So just just <laughs> go get those. Like, that's, that's six, seven years worth of work if you care. You know, just get those. Yeah. And then you'll see some other things as a result of reading those, and you know you're you'll end up with the infinity stack anyway. All that all the hair splitting about what needs to be on the list and whatever is moot to me. Just nobody reads them anyway. Yeah, but you could leave off the new stuff for sure. Like past Dante. <laughs> uh, I was thinking past past Heidegger, but okay. We have different tastes. Dear dear listener, Scott and I have different tastes, especially in... I kind of like continental philosophy. I like the existentialists. And every time I propose one, he'll do it. And then he's... Like, through the whole podcast, I can just see the look it's, on his face. is like he's got a sour oh, lemon. so bad. And he'll say... He'll try to engage it. And I'm like, isn't this Kierkegaard great? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> it's not no. his thing. No, it is not. Not his thing. He is a Thomist through and through. Crypto-Catholic. It's not a bad thing to be. It's probably a better thing to be. Probably I am I am enamored with the... It's because I'm more degenerate than you that I am enamored with the more <laughs> degenerate philosophers. Bad. Yeah, he's got, I don't know, pages and pages here about why they didn't pick this one or that one or more writers from you know this epic or that e epoch. Whatever, all that st all that stuff's so boring. Yeah, I like what he says about, and and we've adopted it. OGB, you know, read the book, don't read the critical apparatus, uh, the dissections by the nerd scholars. That's no good. That they're getting in the way of you and the book. You can go read Dante. It's okay. You won't know who the names are, but you can read it, and then you can look them up later. But let the poetry hit yeah. you. Just go read it. Boy, the great books of the Western world set. By the way, you mentioned Dante. I think I read, I've read a couple of translations, and I think, was it Lombardo is the most recent one I read? I think that's the one that Hackett sells. And 
man, just glorious footnotes. You know, so when they've got all those names in there, they're like, well, well, this was the mayor of this city state or whatever. And, you know, it tells you who those people were. But the great books of the Western world, almost no footnotes. There are some, very few footnotes. The margins are way too small. The the print is too small. Mm -hmm. It's printed in two columns per page. I love them. Like I said, I've got three sets. They're they're fucking terrible. They're terrible. It's almost <laughs> as bad as it could possibly be. Well, you know, if you join us, you, we send you books. And they're not the great books of the Western world set. You can do better. Although a lot of the books that we use are the same translations, but they're printed and bound differently. Like we use the Lattimore and yeah. green stuff, um, you know, whatever. But... Uh, man, they're they're just poorly done. The aesthetic is important. Yep, yeah, books need to look good, and I have definite ideas on how they should look. They need to have more margin on the page than print. Yep, yeah. and you don't want to have any space between the lines. And there's an optimal width, which is probably three and a half inches that your eye can easily scan over the one line and back to the next without having to go all the way across mm -hmm. the page. So the way you could figure this out, so go get yourself a book published, say, in 1907. And just, you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe or something. I don't know, just some book. Just grab it. You don't have to read it. You just have to grab it, okay? And open it up and look at how beautiful the typesetting is when a craftsman who could read backwards right. set those letters as an artist to make a beautiful book. That's what books ought to look like. <laughs>